All right, can we get a big round of applause for the road crew? They have been awesome. So I'm Chris McComb, uh, I'm on the academic side of things, and I'm really excited to share with you today some of our work on design for artificial intelligence. The big idea being, how do we structure teams, organizations, work in such a way that we can bring AI seamlessly into what we do? Um, so I wanna share a little bit about myself, first of all. Uh, the first time I really remember interacting or, or thinking about design was during a spelling bee, um, last century. Um, during a spelling bee, uh, third grade or something, and the judge said, Chris, your word is design. And I stood up and very confidently spelled it D-E-Z-I-G-N. Uh, and I've learned from my mistakes, like all good engineers and algorithms do. Um, and if we fast forward a little bit, I now have the pleasure of working at Carnegie Mellon University as a professor who focuses on engineering design and analytics. Um, and I also have the pleasure of leading our human plus AI design initiative, um, uh, building off of the last talk very nicely. Uh, what we believe in the initiative is that really the best solutions that we're going to find are hybrid solutions. Solutions that bring together both human and AI to really do things that are magical and creative and interesting. Um, in the initiative, we bring together perspectives from across the university, uh, including engineering, computer science, uh, our Tepper School of Business as well. So we really come at this problem of how to use AI in engineering from a multidisciplinary and a transdisciplinary perspective. And one of the things that gets us most excited is working with need holders, working with all of you uh, who bring really interesting, fascinating problems to bear. And I think today all of us are here because we can find ourselves somewhere in this Venn diagram. Um, maybe we're outside of it, uh, but probably somewhere inside of it. Um, I come at it more from the computation and design side, but thanks to folks like uh, Tim Simpson, I'm finding my way up towards additive manufacturing. You know, when I think about CDFAM, right? Manufacturing is hard enough. Right? When we add the A onto that, additive manufacturing, the promise gets bigger, but it also gets a little harder. Right? When we add the D onto the front, DFAM, right? more promise, but also some more challenges. Add the C, same story. More challenges, but also more promise. Uh, and when I started working in this area, I saw you know, something that resonates with what the last two speakers have said, which is we have a lot of challenges around data. Um, so together we propose uh, this idea of design for, in for artificial intelligence, a set of principles that's oriented towards helping us develop better AI at this intersection of computation, design, and manufacturing. So I'd like to structure my, my talk today around three ideas, three themes, uh, composition, collaboration, and finally ending with a, a little word of caution. So composition. Um, I, I love this, uh, this pyramid, the AI hierarchy of needs, because it takes us all the way from collecting the data up to achieving AI, right? And down at the base, we need to generate sense log data, right? Or work with uh, Alexa to have our data produced, right? Then we, have, we need data infrastructure to store, to, uh, to hold our data, warehousing. We need some cleaning and some preparation, right? ETL then data analytics, machine learning, and AI. And you could argue that maybe I've compressed the top end of this a little bit. Um, but that's because I needed room to fit all of these in. So these are our DFAI principles, and they're really clustered near the base of the pyramid. And that's intentional, because that's where we think the greatest need is right now. In order to support better AI, we need to support better data development. So these are six, uh, what we think of as pretty general principles uh, that we encourage people to adopt as they're beginning their AI journey uh, in order to really seed the ground for subsequent AI development. And the first one is uh, simple. I think maybe for, for all of us in the room, it seems a little trivial, uh, but I was recently working with a construction company um, that wanted to start using more AI. And it's a different world, right? A lot of construction is still driven by paper drawings, by PDFs. 
stuff that does not digitize very well necessarily. But as soon as we start digitizing data, that opens up a whole slew of possibilities. The next step, though, is attaching some value to that data, right? We need to assess both the current value of data sets and add that as essentially metadata to the data set itself, but also the potential future value, right? Many of us are planning out several years in our organizations, right? And data needs to be part of that valuation. Uh, in a lot of cases, we can think about data, AI, ML as another kind of CapEx. Next, uh, and I, I loved hearing this in the last couple of talks, metadata, right? Maybe in comparison to, to some colleagues who are more compu pure computer science, we live and die by the metadata, right? This is why we hate STLs, right? <laughs> because STLs hold so little metadata, right? We need surface finish, we need material, we need all of that information in order to make effective design AI. The next idea is uh, machine readability, right? Once we have our data, once we have it warehoused, we need to make it operable for AI agents, for algorithms, things like that. And then the next point is one that's especially important in manufacturing, linkage integrity. As we keep growing this digital thread, right, as the digital thread gets longer, we need to be able to track assets across that digital thread integrate and link that data. And then finally, uh, evolution. I was looking for uh, a good image of the evolution of 3D printing, uh, and everything stopped at about 2018. Um, and I was not the person to put together the new figure. Uh, but evolution is a really critical part. Um, I was speaking with a, a few folks earlier. Uh, the last six months of AI and machine learning have been wild. Right? So it's essential to keep up with that and keep updating these generalizable principles. So the, the big takeaway from this first C, composition, is that AI is only going to be as strong as the data and the infrastructure that it's built upon. And by paying more attention to the data up front, we're seeding the ground for subsequent AI development efforts. Facile data, easy data makes for easier AI development. So let's say we you know, embrace these principles, we start to develop AI solutions internally through collaborations. Um, what does collaboration now start to look like in this environment? Uh, how do our teams work? What do our teams look like? And what my, my lab has started to see is that some core, what we call DeFi doers, have started to emerge. Um, and we see sort of three archetypes or, or three roles emerging. Um, one is you know, a little familiar, a sort of engineering design role. Um, but then we also need AI developers, right? And that might seem like, a, oh yeah, of course, we need people to develop the AI. But I think that the folks that we need in this community are really unique in that respect, right? because we need folks who have the AI knowledge, but also the engineering and the manufacturing knowledge, right? So when I think about this AI developer persona, I picture somebody who you know, had a comp sci undergrad degree and maybe went to Penn State for their AM master's degree or vice versa, right? Has a mechanical engineering undergrad degree, came to a CMU for an AI degree of some sort, right? Really inter interdisciplinary in that respect. And then we need uh, people or organizations who are going to curate our design data, right? People who own the data are absolutely essential. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, like, uh, like uh, Francis said, um, these people are working in the background, right? And not many of us end up touching and curating data on a daily basis, but this is absolutely essential. And maybe even more important than who these people are is how they're connected and supported within an organization. But what I want to think about with the, the next few slides is you know, what starts to happen when some of these people or some of these personas, these roles, are taken on by AI agents. Um, so my lab has uh, been looking and thinking about this for a while. And we've run experiments that show that teams can benefit from AI as a tool, AI as a coach, and maybe potentially AI as a partner. Um, these are all you know, early stage experiments. Uh, and we conducted them in the context of a last mile delivery task. So we brought in teams of five or six uh, students. 
we gave them the task of uh, designing a drone delivery business. Everything from configuring their drones to figuring out how to route them around and make deliveries to actually figuring out how to turn a profit and make some money. Um, we worked with a fantastic team of developers at Penn State ARL to put together essentially a stripped down CAD environment for doing and supporting this work. Um, so here's our drone design environment. We have uh, copters, we also have airfoils and wings, uh, and we have an evaluation engine built in that gives us uh, cost, speed, distance, and uh, lifting capacity. Now, the AI agents in this uh, are essentially an easy button um, in the first iteration. So you hit the easy button, it generates some potential solutions based off of your current one that are improvements in one direction or another and presents this option set to you. We have similar uh, interfaces for the operations members of the team who are in charge of routing drones around our simulated city. And then we have a business role. This is really similar to operations, but with some additional uh, data analytics based into it. So they can start to compare and trade off between these different uh, operations plans and routes within the context of having the drone. So the first experiment that we ran looked at AI as a tool, right? So essentially participants, everybody had access to an AI powered easy button that would help them out when they clicked on it. Um, and we compared against teams that did not have that button. And the green icons here show the, the stuff that's sort of a head nodding truth. Yeah, they'd do better, they'd create better solutions, make more profit. Yes, we also saw that they explored a little more broadly in the solution space. But what was interesting to us is that there was also a different focus for the human members of the team. So when we went back and looked at the chat logs, when we looked at their activity logs, we saw that they were chatting more, acting less, and that they were talking about higher value, right? So they were talking about you know, sense making, about strategy, and a little bit less tactical. Um, so integrating AI tools leads to a fundamental human shift in cognition. Second, within the same drone design context, we started to look at AI as a coach. So here, uh, when I say coach, this is a, an AI agent or a human member of the team that was in charge of monitoring the team process. Nothing to do specifically with the content of what the team was doing, but process. Who was talking to who, how often they were talking, how often they were logging designs, you know, rate of work, stuff like that. And in this experiment, we constrained both the AI and the human to have a consistent set of templated messages. So we wanted to, as far as possible, try to blind the participants to what was the AI and what was the human. Um, we saw that the AI you know, performed about on par with the human coaches, the human moderators. But one really important difference is that the AI was able to make more targeted guidance recommendations. So what does that mean? Um, our human coaches would generally make broad announcements to the team and say, hey, I noticed you're slowing down, can you work a little faster? Or, hey, I noticed nobody's talking anymore, can we talk some more? Whereas the AI agent was able to absorb and use more detailed information in order to provide targeted interventions to individuals. So this is what we see as potentially some great symbiosis between a human manager and an AI coach, right? Taking some of the strategy and the tactics um, one thing that did surprise us a little bit um, was that almost across the board, regardless of which condition, 25% uh, of the time participants thought they were being coached by a human. 75% of the time they thought it was an AI. Um, so I think this speaks to some, things, you know, some, some mistrust potentially uh, of management, maybe not, uh, but maybe a, a healthy mistrust of uh, AI systems. And then finally, we looked at AI as a partner. So in this case, we had some human teams, we had some uh, hybrid teams where we ripped out half of the people and replaced them with AI agents. And in this case, we had a, a, a basic natural language wrapper around the agents. This work was done a, a couple of years ago, so nothing too sophisticated. But this experiment was all surprises. So when we set it up, we wanted to essentially establish failure cases. So we wanted to understand how these teams failed when they had AI agents. 
So in the first half of the experiment, it was a relatively simple drone design task. In the second half, we started putting in size limitations, we put in no-fly zones in the town, and these were things that were fundamentally out of representation for our AI agents. So our AI agents couldn't even see the obstacles. What ended up happening, though, was that in both halves of the experiment, the hybrid teams were on par with the human teams. We expected the second half, our hybrid teams would tank. What happened instead was the team started to communicate to adapt. So we saw in the second half that communication, especially communication between human and AI elements of the team, skyrocketed. And when we started to look into what they were saying and the directions they were giving, there was really sort of folks in the team taking on the role of an AI handler, right? So people were translating back into representation in order to guide the AI and enable them to remain as effective members of the team. So to, to sum up this second C on collaboration, uh, I'd just like to say that there are many different ways, shapes, and forms that we can collaborate with AI agents, AI tools, AI algorithms, and they all potentially have different benefits. So moving on to the third C, a little bit of caution. Um, so in this experiment, we didn't want to tank the performance of hybrid teams. We wanted our hybrid teams to do really well. Um, so we, you know, one of our favorite applications in the lab is structural design. But apparently, Yeah, I know, AI doesn't like what I'm saying. I should have loaded the algorithm off of my laptop. Um, so we have a, essentially a trust design AI that can provide recommendations and provide a little guidance to people as they work. And you'll see that pop up on the bottom here in a second. Um, so essentially we show heat maps of where they should add new joints, members, et cetera, but also where they should remove material or where they have an opportunity to remove some mass. Um, so this is really a case, again, of AI as a tool, right? So in this experiment, we had some participants who had access to this AI-powered recommendation, some folks who didn't. And what we ended up seeing is that across the board, using this AI agent tanked performance. Um, and this was fascinating because when we let this thing crank on its own, it outperforms humans. But when we allow it to make recommendations and we rely on people to interpret and use those recommendations, it doesn't help. What we saw in some of the exit interviews was that the folks using AI uh, had a false belief that they are performing better. Um, this might have been you know, tied to how we uh, introduced the experiment or something like that, but this was, this was interesting. And then the, the one bright note was that at least initially it helped the worst performers. Um, but after a while, they too uh, started to, to not do as well. So this is just a counterexample to illustrate the point that as we start to use AI in our own work, we should really embrace a trust but verify mindset. Um, and I, I think especially as we enter a world of more performant AI agents, we need to be cognizant of some of these risks. Um, you know, last night I was going to end on that note, uh, but especially after this conference and meeting a bunch of folks here, I wanted to, to add something that's a little more upbeat. Um, and I think that this fourth C is community, right? So I started off the talk by showing this Venn diagram and, you know, asking you all to find yourselves in this diagram. And I think that we're all in different parts of it, right? Maybe subtly different, maybe different corners of this space but we all find ourselves here together because we care and we believe in CDFAM, right? It's gonna take a lot of work. It's gonna take all of us, but I cannot think of a community that I'd rather work with. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.